So good morning to everyone. And thank you for joining us for this information session uh, today on open science being organized by the University of Malta as part of Work Package 5 for Research EU. Uh, I am Dr. Fiona Samult from the Department of Statistics and Operations Research at the University of Malta, and I will be chairing uh, this session. Without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to Mr. Juan Ramon Real Buncas. Um, he's the project manager for Research EU at the University of Cadiz uh, to give a brief welcome on behalf of Research EU. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fiona. And uh, well, good morning and uh, welcome to this meeting once again to, to everyone. I am, I am Juan Ramon. I work as a technical manager for Research EU at the University of, of Cadiz. And I would like to give you a very brief overview, a very brief introduction to the, to the Research EU project within the umbrella of the CU Alliance. I believe that most of you will be at this time familiarized with the European University of the Seas. We are an alliance composed of six coastal universities spread across the, the European coastline, uh, the University of Split in Croatia, the University of Malta, the University of Cadiz, uh, the University of Brest, the universities of Gdansk and Kiel. And very soon, uh, there will be joining us three other new partners from, uh, from Norway, Portugal, and, and Italy. So uh, the, the main idea, the core idea of the European University of, of the Seas is uh, to, make, uh, to make ourselves stronger by, by uniting efforts and by, by joining our, our research resources and infrastructures. In this regard, uh, whereas we have uh, an Erasmus Plus project focused on education-related activities, developing joint programs and, and other important initiatives, in the research aspect, we are developing the Research U project, uh, which uh, focuses on certain thematic areas, such as institutional resilience under the motto, in our case, of anti-fragility, innovation and entrepreneurial mindset across our researchers, uh, citizen science, all the co-creation projects and how we can uh, increase engagement from the civil society in all research activities carried out at our universities, the development of common research agendas across the different partners of this consortium, and lastly, but not less importantly, uh, I would say that even, uh, ranking at, at the top of importance in this project, we've got open science, which is the, the main topic of, of this meeting. In open science, uh, the, the European University of, of the Seas has two main objectives. On the one hand, we are intending to provide uh, our respective research communities with technical means that may allow them to make their research more findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable by other, by other researchers across, across Europe and the world, actually. In, uh, broadly speaking, we intend to make things easier to, to get our, uh, our science, our research open up. But on the other hand, we understand and, and we acknowledge that there is a huge challenge when it comes to spreading uh, open, open science practices across our research communities. Because how many of, of you, how many of us have already uh, been in a situation in which the term open science was not familiar for some of our research colleagues? Uh, we are still, and I believe that this is a, uh, a situation common for universities all across Europe, actually, in which there are still many researchers who uh, neither know what benefits may bring open science practices, the adoption of open science practices, nor acknowledge the, 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 huge, uh, the huge importance open science has for science as a whole. The opportunity to make available data sets, not only the results, the research results being as an open access platform, but also providing 
other researchers with the data sets on which our research results are, are based. This is, uh, this is crucial to make our research more transparent, reliable, and uh, well, broadly speaking, better. So uh, I hope this has given you a very brief but comprehensive idea of our main objectives. Uh, I, I personally believe that open science must be one of the crucial goals for, for the CU Alliance. I believe also that our colleagues at the University of Malta are doing a great work, a great work promoting and leading the open science efforts across the CU Alliance. And I am looking forward to, to seeing how this meeting unfolds. So thank you very much. Let's go on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Um, Real Ram, uh, Pujita, Ricas, um, uh, for your welcoming note. And also, thank you for all the work that you're doing on research you as well. Thank you. Thanks to you. Thanks to you, of course. OK, so now it is my pleasure to yield the floor to Dr. Etienne Gauci. Um, Dr. Gauci is an academic at the Department of Geography at the University of Malta. She will be speaking about grasping the breadth and depth of open science. Um, we will allocate some time to address questions or any comments at the end. Okay, so yes, so Dr. Gauti, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fiona. Thank you, Juan Ramon, for that nice introduction. It's a really a pleasure to support um, CEU, but also now research um, CEU in various forums, um, not just as an outreach subcommittee member, but also now as an open science ambassador for research. I come as a very neutral participant to open science in the sense um, that I try to look um, at the different dimensions of the science, um, at the benefits, its nuances, its uh, limitations and also its barriers. So um, I think that a true work, a true ambassadorial work requires that we are as much as possible objective in understanding how to improve open science by also addressing the key challenges of open science. In just under an hour, it will be difficult to discuss everything about open science. But what I really hope is through this meeting to start a conversation across the CEU um, esteemed partners about this large and rapidly uh, emerging dimension. Um, can I share my screen, Fiona? Yes, you can. OK. Okay, you can see your screen. Thank you. So um, I'll start with something really simple, but I, which I really think it's um, a powerful example of uh, what happened last week as, a, as an example of open data um, or, or, more, or even better open science. So um, I wish to start to, with the simple example to, to make us aware of it, how open science is affecting our daily lives as well. And I'll start with um, a Google Doogle that appeared last week, last Friday. Um, for those of us who are Chrome users, um, they might have seen this um, Google Doogle um, appearing on the screen in every tab um, above the search engine bar. This feature has become, this Google Doodle has become a quite a regular feature in, you know, in the user interface of Google Chrome. It's almost considered normal to find these, um, these doodles nowadays. Um, they mark international anniversaries or an international event. They can spend a day, 24 hours, sometimes even a week, if there is an important event that, you know, such as, for example, the Olympics. So it's a normal thing to see on Google Chrome. So well, last Friday, it was um, the turn of this time-lapse composition of images from a very powerful software, another open powerful software, which is Google Earth. And uh, what I have chosen here um, are two examples of these Google Doodles that have appeared. One is um, of coral bleaching at the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Um, and the other one is the, um, a deforestation process happening in Germany as a result of infestation brought by drought and uh, increase in temperatures. So Google decided to use this time-lapse imagery on this day because obviously 
um, for um, many of us are aware the 20, 22nd of April is actually Earth Day, International Earth Day. And so Google decided to use um, its powerful um, software, Google Earth, but also its powerful search engine to um, address one of the most pressing topics in our time, which is climate change. Also in the wake of what recently has been published by the IPCC, which is the International Panel on Climate Change. So we see here a very simple example, but a very powerful example of, of, open, of open science. And it's very powerful because, first of all, it's been engineered by an open spatial software, which is Google Earth Finance Imagery. It was made publicly accessible by an open search engine, which is Google Chrome. It is supported by third parties providing data. Um, Notice the courtesy to the Ocean Agency for the time-lapse imagery of the, co of the coral breaching. It's also available to extract and uh, use another forum, using other data, data sharing tools. Um, it's also available to use um, for other um, services, which in this case can be educational, can be advocacy. And most importantly, it's also an understandable form of science communication. So all that, um, just by a simple um, example, shows how open science can really um, be something powerful, simple, understandable, reachable to everyone who, um, in this case, is a Chrome user, an internet user. So this is um, just to bring a bit of the understanding that open science is not just relegated to an institutional um, dimension or relegated to a government dimension. It's it's, it's something that we are surrounded every day with, and we are exposed to, even though it might not carry the label of the science, but it's actually there um, impacting on us and affecting our daily lives and our perspectives. And therefore, it's important to, to keep in mind uh, that open science is everywhere, it's really around us. The agenda will not be heavy because the time um, at our disposal is not very much. So I will just go through some basic overviews, um, some interesting um, hindsight in terms of understanding. I try not to avoid presenting data which is already available online. The, the, the online, uh, there is a lot of information about open science and you really don't need this presentation for me to replicate what's there. But what I'll do is I'll try to very much bring in what is the status and the key um, issues at the moment being debated um, internationally about open science, especially from the European perspective. What I would also would like is to also use my field of discipline, geography, as an example to show what are the key debates that um, geographers and uh, earth scientists are at the moment debating when it comes to, to open science. Hopefully, in the, to start also a conversation in understanding and sensitizing ourselves of what happen, what's happening in other disciplines as well. So I'll start with, with definitions. And again, I will not um, be replicating that definition, which you can easily find uh, online. But I will, what I'd like to draw the attention is maybe to the fact that the web is imploding literally with so much information about open science that even the simple exercise of looking up a definition of open science may feel like you're falling into literally a rabbit hole. So many different definitions, so many different perspectives of what open science is. Even the word science has been debated for quite a while in the term open science. Um, whether it should be anything else like open scholarship or open research, in order to try and be inclusive of, of all the fields and also the traditional fields that don't, um, don't really blend and represent themselves as science, but rather as humanities or social, or social fields. Um, we continue to use open science as a term eventually, even because you know, of stakeholders surveys that were done at European level um, and done by the European Commission that really um, understood from these stakeholder surveys that the term open science is really something that most, most people um, are quite familiar with and therefore it has not um, been made redundant. So when you talk about science, really we're talking in the wider spread of the word and includes all, all, fields, of the, of, all fields of the 
discipline in, in that respect. If you see these definitions, you start to also see different things coming out of them. The fact that some definitions focus on public funded research, but is open science just about public funded research? One is actually not sure whether open is totally open or if there are some restrictions and if there are how they are applied in practice. Um, Nielsen went, um, went stretched it to the sense of also saying sharing everything um, as it happens. Um, coming from the field, the academic field, um, we rarely share data as it happens, but we will go through a screening process, uh, a calibration process, uh, a reviewing process. Um, so we never publish, most researchers never publish data as it happens, but rather it takes sometimes years to eventually come to the stage of publishing um, something which can be meaningful. There is also the notion of cooperation. Science is a social animal, and it's becoming increasingly so as time goes by. Uh, we see it also, for example, um, how Nobel Prizes are getting awarded as time goes by. We see more and more joint um, disciplines, um, joint scientists getting awarded by the Nobel Prize um, rather than a single individual scientist. And therefore, yes, we um, are seeing so many different blends and, uh, and shades of how um, one looks at open science, which is really also normal. And this is normal because um, open science is also the value of open science relies, relies very much on the interpretation attached to it and really in terms of where the focus and where the value lies in terms of either its process or its outcomes or it's underpinning philosophy. So depending where one attributes that value and that focus, then the definition will really be focused on that. So it's really normal to um, have some, something so huge and so complex um, being identified according to different norms and practices. There are so schools of thought that, are, that have, been, have emerged in the last decade. Um, an interesting study by Fakir and Frieska um, in 2013, really explained that the push to implement the, the open science agenda is, is very much um, linked to, to various schools of thoughts, primarily five schools of thoughts. The first one is believing that there is an unequal distribution of access to knowledge and that therefore it's important to make scholarly knowledge, including publications and data, available and free to all, so science as a form of democratic tool. There is also the pragmatic school, which follows the principle that creating knowledge should be more efficient, and therefore it should be made of more efficient through collaboration, it should be made more efficient through critique, um, and it should be made more efficient through transparency, transparent mechanisms, so the pragmatic element of how we can network better also to make uh, science uh, more meaningful. There is also the school of thought of the infrastructure, which basically um, is motivated by the fact that um, efficient research requires available platforms in the, the, in the age that we're living of digital revolution. It requires tools, it requires services um, to keep at pace with the opportunities that the digital revolution is bringing. And therefore there is this infrastructure element and the school of thought driving um, open science. There is also the public school of thought as well. The public school of thought is recognizing um, that the true societal impact of science requires engagement with society. So science can make impact on society when it engages with society. And, and also communicates understandable um, scientific results to society. So open science is also driving that, um, and it links therefore heavily with citizen science as well, and how science can, and how citizens can be empowered by the, the understandable knowledge that is transmitted from, from open science. And then there is also the measurement school of thought. The measurement school of thought is acknowledging that traditional metrics um, to measure scientific achievements, to measure scientific impact um, has proven problematic over the years. 
um, especially very whole focused on publications, focused on general level, general impacts. And therefore the school of thought is, is actually driving open science to find alternative metrics where we can measure impact, where we can measure um, significance and we can measure meaningful science um, in terms of impact of scholarship. So um, there are various, various schools of thoughts, one not exclusive from the other. Um, you can have more than one school of thought complementing another one in that respect. So here, it's not a divisive school of thought really, but they all come together and um, build on what is required for open science to be really a tool for all. So as you can imagine, um, the, um, the structure really then defines the taxonomy of open science. This is uh, really much the state at which we are at the moment in terms of understanding how open science is growing and how each element really and truly would require dedicated training sessions as for those who fully understand what's, what's happening um, in this structure. It's a, a structure which um, is very positive to see in terms of growing. Growing means that it's somehow being a success. It, um, growing means that it is valid. Growing means that um, it's an important element, that uh, it's an important um, journey that uh, one embarks when, when one believes in open science. So, but when you think about it behind this structure, behind um, the drive for open access, behind the drive for open data, which really are not, as, which are really not, not new assumptions that the tradition of openness itself has been at the roots of, of science. But the current development of information and communication technologies um, have transformed the scientific practices. So behind this, behind the structure, there isn't just the researcher working and driving and being driven by the research process. There are librarians building and updating the repository infrastructure. There are ICT specialists building the domains. There are the ser and, and the servers that are required to host the data. There are the policymakers and the government bodies that are analyzing the funding mechanisms um, that is required to tap public research, which is important for, for the country. There are private partnerships as well, and there are also lawyers drafting new laws and new ethic principles regarding sensitive and personal data dissemination. So this, um, the whole take home message here is that the open science is really the responsibility um, of not just the researcher, not just of the institutions, but of the broader scale um, of society members in all, in all their levels and, and their specialization. Uh, just a, a side note, Foster is a, a very interesting portal, e-learning portal, uh, that brings together the, a very, some very good training resources that address to those who need to know more about open science or need to develop strategies and skills um, to, um, to eventually to implement open science practices in their, their daily workflows. It's a, it's a very good site um, done through an EU project. So I sincerely recommend you to, to have a look at it. So last September, um, the European Commission, um, who has been always a front runner in adopting open science as a policy target, um, published um, perspectives on the future of open science. Um, and uh, the aim of this, the aim of this study was really to try and see what are the most important drivers and barriers uh, in the adoption of open science practices, um, and how those drivers and barriers are currently being employed in. Um, in three regions in obviously the European Union, in China and the United States. So the understanding is that by an analyzing the future of open science within these three, um, these three um, uh, countries, um, one can also see how open science policies might eventually shift um, 
in terms of you know the power relations between these countries and how research is done and open science is done between these three three um, countries that have have the three regions that have been invested in R and I. So I will just tackle two um, two important aspects of this report because I don't necessarily have time. But I will tackle um, more um, more specifically on open access and on open data and what are the key findings um, of the European Commission when it comes. And some of them are indeed what Juan Ramon has been saying in terms of researchers um, not fully aware of, of open science and the benefits of open science. And so when it comes to therefore open data, open data, um, is uh, probably one of, one of the most important and uh, not difficult to address in terms of understanding um, how can eventually data become available online, free of cost, accessible, how can it be used, how can it be reused and distributed. And, uh, and the understanding is that um, data um, requires a significant amount of investment in infrastructure to be able to come to that stage of being shareable data. In fact, um, in 2016, um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the fair data principles, which um, were principles that were designed for scientific data management and, and stewardship. And the principles emphasize the aspect um, very much of machine actionability, meaning the capacity of compu computational systems to find, to access, to interoperate and reuse data, um, as almost without minimal human interventions, um, because humans are increasingly, increasingly relying on computation support to deal with data. As a result of the volume of data that's being that it's capable, the interface, the digital interface is capable of, of uh, collecting the complexity and also the speed. And so um, the fair data principles try tries to guide um, this in terms of how um, to make data findable, access, accessible, interoperable, and, and also reusable. In terms of key findings um, by the European Commission about um, open data, um, the European Commission found that the key finding is that there is still a lack of awareness amongst the many researchers about the benefits of open data. And, uh, and, that, and that journals and research funders are on one hand the main actors providing incentives for open data. But on the other hand, in themselves, not directly, but in themselves representing an important element um, of publication that serves for promotions and serves for career trajectory. In themselves, journals and research funders are therefore also key building blocks that can eventually discourage researchers to share data because they are need to mine that data for more papers, for more publications. So we have an ambivalent situation here um, that also the researcher is there trying to understand um, how can, um, through his career trajectory or her career trajectory, be able to be more, be more open at sharing data, but at the same time protect the career trajectory uh, that they have to go through. Um, the European Commission found that, however, that yes, open data is becoming very beneficial for society and especially for researchers themselves. Um, and in fact, yes, for example, as a geographer, um, having open data and having open software systems that can help me in my research is definitely undeniable. The only universal barrier that was found is that it simply takes time. Um, and you have to see this dimension, and this is something which I explain in my paper when we speak about the value of open data, is that you have institutions which are exclusively working on research, they don't have administrative duties, they don't have um, teaching duties, then they have research institutions that have a, a component which is heavy on teaching, and therefore you have these different um, modes of work, of practices by the researchers um, who might actually not have enough um, time to eventually uh, 
support and create the right the right um, the right practices to share to make the data shareable because another important element is that it's not enough to have a spreadsheet and share it online there needs to be a supportive infrastructure the data needs to be understandable um, the data needs to be validated as well prior to publication so there is this element that it's all the time bringing back needing more and more time the other barriers which were found in many, not just by the European Commission, but also in many studies, um, one of them it was done by Levin in the United Kingdom universities, and specifically on the, for example, the myomedical field. And they found that there are barriers that can be very um, field specific, um, and the concerns would be um, to be being outcompeted, um, issues related to having your data being misused for other things, um, and also privacy issues. Uh, in my field, for example, in geography, even though it's just one field, actually within it, um, there are debates as well between the physical geographers and the human geographers. On one side, you have the physical geographers who have a long tradition of sharing data and collecting data and uh, have a, a larger spectrum of collaborations and therefore are more, um, are more predisposed for open data. On the other hand, you have human geographers. Uh, some of them would collect sensitive data and they therefore, therefore are more resistant to eventually share the data unless there is a, a safe mechanism where certain privacy um, and sensitive data can be, can be eventually protected and ensured. The other um, dimension is, is open access. And the, in open access, um, which refers again to um, the ab ability to, um, the availability to um, access free of cost uh, scientific content in the forms of publication, journals. And even here, um, it's been a long journey as well. I mean, it's um, the governance of open access um, really started with initiatives that date back to 2001 with the Budapest Open Access Initiative, and eventually culminated with the Berlin Declaration, uh, and continues to be refined and, and revised, like, so, like with the Finch Report. So what we see here is, again, another dimension, um, very connected to open data, but also separate, in the sense that open access then is um, related also the avenues where one is going to publish data, how he's going to publish the, um, the data in the forms of journals, in the form of reports, um, who should have access to, to, your, to your data as well. So, so the, um, the overarching principles are also um, important and they are endorsed by the European Union in, in, the fact, in actually having um, an important um, an important element of good science when there is open access and when they are when there is um, long-term access and not just a time window access um, it's also a, a good science to have your information available to the public so accessible it's a good science to also be visible uh, with your research it's good science to also be accountable with your research so the access dimension um, it's int intensively becoming also an important element. The European Commission in this regard is seeing that yes, more and more research funders are requiring open access publication of the results, also as an accountability label of the outcomes of um, th that research package. Um, the, only, the only barriers that they are seeing is that the more diverse and the more funding mechanisms that are injected into, into, um, into research, the more there is a larger diversity of projects, the, a larger variety of funding mechanisms, and that is creating in itself, uh, so um, positively, uh, is creating a, um, a much more participative and, and, and intensive way of doing um, open science but it's creating in itself also legal and practical uncertainties that need to also be addressed as time goes by. So definitely there is more awareness um, and in that respect, and researchers are generally regarding open access as a positive phenomenon as well, uh, especially considering that um, the current metrics as they are, that 
yeah, the more your access, your your publications are accessible, the more they can potentially become citable, and the more they become citable, then the more they can have visibility, and eventually can help also to elevate your status as a scientist. Um, the European Commission also, however, finds that there is still a traditional recognition of high impact journal, which is given more importance than uh, than open access journals. Um, many research councils um, and societies are now removing financial incentives to encourage more scientists to, to publish um, open access. And therefore, there are new routes that are being all the time, um, all the time engineered to try very much and offer a wider spectrum of where scientists can publish and provide visibility to their research. In fact, um, this is a typical example of um, that you would mostly often find when discussing open access, the availability of having um, two mechanisms of open access, which is the gold open access and the green open access. They, um, they are different in terms of access and you know, the fees that are um, um, used and, and, and the user interface behind it. And you would find that different countries um, very much um, steer either in one way or another, depending on the institution encouragement um, to publish either through the gold route or also through the green or through the green route. The traditional gold route um, is publishing fully open access um, where the institution um, can potentially also um, pay um, per art for the article processing charges. The green route is when the author publishes a version of the publication in a repository. There is also now the hybrid route as well, which it's um, a publication that is published in a journal um, or on a, on a publishing platform. But then the author is giving uh, the possibility, or his or her institution is giving the possibility to pay article processing charges to make the, the, um, the journal fully, fully accessible, open access. So there is this hybrid kind of route as well that is increasingly being adopted also by, by journals. Open, the route of open access is now all the more evolving. And now we have also the, uh, the diamond route as well, which is um, when a publication is published in an open access journal or an alternative publication platform, and there are no financial contributions from the author or the organization. Um, these are often owned um, and funded by academic communities, like for example, the Open Research Europe or the Free uh, Journal Network. So these are um, really like a new evolution in terms of access route. And in fact, in 2021, it's been estimated that 29,000 scientific journals really rely on diamond open access um, as a model. You have countries like, for example, Latin, you have regions like, for example, Latin America, 95% uh, of their journals um, actually um, follow, follow the diamond route. Um, especially in response to publicly supported platforms like the CLO and the, um, the Red Lights. So there are, there are definitely um, new, uh, new developments and we will continue to see that um, in the years to come. As I said before, um, the, the European Commission also tried to see how the EU, uh, United States and China power relations when it comes to um, the domain of open science um, and the development of open science, how it's, it's faring um, at a regional level. Um, and especially when considering China and the United States and the high scientific output that they provide and, and how that is eventually affecting the development of the science systems also in the European Union. Um, they are large funders and producers of scientific research and development in these regions that may eventually in future influence the position of even European scientific research. So, and therefore they tried to, um, European Commission tried to also do an assessment in terms of understanding how the qualities and the criteria that make up the open access um, for China, United States and European Union. 
And you can see that there are some variations. Um, so open access does come with some elements and open science does come with some elements of, of uh, variabilities. Like for example, in China, um, the green route is mostly mandated, but Chinese researchers are very much preferring the gold route as access. Um, however, data must first be submitted to government sanctioned data centers before it is published. So there are practices which are um, different, um, respecting also the culture, how, you know, um, how data is considered um, in relation to also in relation to, to government relations as well. The United States um, has been requiring more and more that online uh, publicly funded research becomes available online with results within 12 months of publication. So we're seeing mandatory certain mechanisms to make sure that the data becomes um, available online. And they have a relatively high share of open access um, from the United States. And but in the institutional mandates play a very much role in the United States more than, more than in China. So there is less of a centralized, a centralized version, version of that. So this is all just an example to help you understand um, how open science at, a, at an international level um, also is very much influenced by, by the um, power relations that exist within, within, each, within each region or within each country. And those will eventually not, they don't exist in isolation, but can eventually also then affect the overall shift of open science um, internationally. So this, just to give you a summary of the, uh, the, um, what the drivers were acknowledged by the European Commission um, as still being important in driving open science um, in terms of education and training available, the financial incentives by the funders, um, the willingness of university to adapt their curriculum for open science. So the drivers are still there and they're still uh, driving open science. The barriers are also still there. Um, uh, and they need to be addressed in terms of uh, a number of things related to, as I said, cost and time of sharing data, about concerns about the misuse of data, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there are barriers that um, it's important to keep in mind, which are impacting from you know, international level down to the personal level of a single researcher. The business is also positioning itself on this huge dimension of open science because of the increasing role of businesses in, in the providing funding for um, academia uh, and private partnerships. But again, um, the uh, position that recently was um, stated by Business Europe, who issued a position statement in 2020 about open science, um, really addresses the fact that one of the key messages is there is no easy criteria for a decision against or for open research data. Um, and that we should, the regulator should not enforce a one size fits all, um, but rather they encourage to build on what the European Commission said in 2018, that to be as open as possible and as closed as necessary um, in order to um, avoid um, avoid any pitfalls that might eventually happen um, in the um, in the trans in the in the drive for open science. Two emerging, they are emerging also in, in conjunction with citizen science. So, open science movement and citizen science are also becoming mutually dynamic between them, and uh, the establishment of citizen science is now becoming an essential element in, in the global perspective as well. And it's requiring an equal weight also in, in open science. So there are emerging movements which are becoming more significant and layered in, in, in the most sophisticated way of understanding how, how um, knowledge is transmitted, how knowledge is communicated. And, and therefore, citizen science is becoming more an important building block to advance open science. Um, there is there isn't one global citizen science community. Um, there isn't one view to represent or one representative body, but what has been happening recently is the establishment of a fora, the citizen science global partnership, which tries to eventually, which tries to eventually um, create a fora where they can 
um, very much code act as a coordinated point for many stakeholders, uh, public, private, um, including, for example, large stakeholders like the United Nations to explore significant and cross-cutting areas um, of citizen science, um, and especially important, important um, issues like uh, metadata standards, um, uh, data validation, data checking, safety of citizens when collecting data. So this is all very important that which also then feeds into, you know, a citizen science into the sustainable development goals as well. So seeing also here the bigger picture. So the, my last 12 minutes um, will be dedicated a bit to my, to understanding um, what are the recent uh, debates ongoing in my field in geography. And also how is my, uh, is this field, is geography um, really uh, capitalizing and benefiting from, from open tools um, and also benefiting in terms also of citizen science communication and, and education. So um, I think one of the most uh, seminal papers uh, that was, uh, that was, uh, was uh, published was the, what is known today as the sticks and carrots paper. Um, by Leonello et al. And in this paper, um, Sabrina Leonelli and her colleagues um, published in the Royal Geographic Society of London, which is a, a, the most important society that governs the whole, you know, um, principles and undertakings in terms of geography. The paper um, can basically address how geography is being redimensioned by the mandate of open science. They also identify really work-related issues and um, how open science should be applied in a method that's meaningful um, in a two-way and it's of value in a two-way direction. So, um, and they propose that um, a number of a number of mechanisms. So they assess the pros and cons, and they 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 actually see that they view open science as an important factor and as a catalyst of public participation. However, they also see um, um, that there is a number of obstacles to open science, which can currently hinder the full realization is that being increasingly transparent might have unintended consequences like publishing something prematurely um, or else, um, or else um, they basically um, address the issue that researchers fear of being scooped that there may be a case of developing incentives and safety mechanisms for researchers to engage in open science in all its stages. Um, the carrots which they propose um, are um, really and truly um, mechanisms which even then the European Commission um, stated in its report in that in the, in the recognition of alternative modes of credit structures um, in terms of uh, sharing practices and how to create more meaningful incentives. And also the recognition of uh, the role of alternative metrics. So again, open science can be a solution to, um, to, these, uh, to these barriers and concerns. Um, another two, uh, two papers, which I don't have time to delve very much in detail because I'm very conscious of the time, is one written um, by myself with Robin Kippen and Andy Gibson from the University of Port about the value of open data. Uh, and here what we are looking is how the uh, drive for open data um, may, actually, um, may actually, in a sense, need to be sensitive to power relations that are happening within institutions. Um, in terms of the progression of, 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 of career researchers, in terms of in terms of uh, of promotion and career trajectory, um, the, the the possibility of uh, um, data mining the research uh, prior to sharing it, um, and so there is um, this. Uh, we bring to we try to bring light very much the social elements and the uh, work related elements in in the physical geography world. Um, that. Um, it's important that open science um, and open data is sensitive to uh, in that regard. Um, the, the editorial by Stuart Lane, uh, Stuart Lane wrote an interesting editorial in Earth Services Process and Landform. Um, and as an editor, an editor um, Stuart makes a, quite of a, an interesting statement when he reflects 
um, and the opponent explains Earth, uh, the policy with respect to data sharing. And Stuart Lane um, really addresses um, clearly a number of important reasons why, yes, he agrees that data should be shared, but they should not be enforced by, by journals. And he basically rules to the fact that um, he says that data sharing cannot become an alternative to field data. So he's making reference to the fact that the value of field data, which takes time to collect, which takes time to process, um, it's still important that it produces a scientific understanding, um, which is equally important as much as the data that it's mined online and eventually pros it into something of a, as a new product. So what he's basically saying here is that in the drive to access available data online, let's not uh, disregard and uh, um, cause um, field work and field data to become you know, a lesser participant in the, geomor in the geomorphology field. But let's make sure that the um, fieldwork data remains an important component of the um, data collection of, of a geomorphologist. And that if the scientist is um, keen and to share that data, um, ESPL will encourage them and provide infrastructure for that, but it will not be a condition for manuscript acceptance. So he's basically saying that um, data collection in one way should not eventually undermine the traditional way, which still has value today in, in, terms, of, in terms of field data. Um, in, term, in geography, what has really been beneficial um, in, is the um, use of geospatial data. I mean, in, the sharing of geospatial data has allowed more and more, especially governments, to share their data, nationalizing the notion of open government now. Um, this is the geospatial platform of the United States um, that um, basically um, shares a, a very important, a very important um, accountability and transparency in data sharing uh, from government to citizen communication. And, and therefore, we see more of these um, geospatial data is now uh, becoming more important, even at, um, in terms of national agency. In terms of software in geography, we're also seeing huge developments um, in terms of these GIS and QGIS um, are, are two leading geographical information systems. One is um, the ArcGIS traditionally was the traditional one um, that is um, available through uh, paying of a license. It uh, has been around for quite a long time and it's the most robust and, um, in spatial data mapping field. It's fully featured program, but it's not available as an open software. So in response to that, QGIS has been um, designed um, which is a linear open source of software version of ArcGIS. It's simpler than ArcGIS to use. Uh, it's good for small projects. And so you find more and more um, individuals, private individuals, students, even academics, preferring to use QGIS uh, because it's easier than to share uh, the formats and the interface with a wider audience and a wider and a wider user interface. So. So you see um, this evolution coming in where you have two softwares um, which can be used. And sometimes it's, it's actually difficult for me um, as, a, as an academic to understand which scientist is using. Sometimes you'd find scientists that prefer ArcGIS because their institution pays for ArcGIS. Then you find other scientists where their institution doesn't pay for ArcGIS, so they use QGIS. And so you need to, um, to align those different softwares in order to continue the collaboration. Um, if, I, if there was a, a silver lining in the pandemic, it's most probably the fact that ESRI has been given prominence in showcasing the power of open software and an open spatial data with the design and implementation of the digital dashboards and that have been replicated in many countries. And they have been showing daily data concerning COVID data. So digital dashboards have been um, instrumental also in managing the management of a pandemic with their huge, large data sets, uh, not only showing disease cases, but also showing healthcare systems, showing app interfaces that are generated by citizen science. So we're seeing um, 
uh, a new development, if I can say if it's new, uh, being two years old now, a new development in using digital dashboards in order to address um, key spatial issues um, as, a, as a digital interface. The power of social media is also um, not only uh, powerful because it generates uh, open data for the public consumption, but it's also used to generate and deliver strong messages through these visualization techniques. Um, what you're seeing here is a case in point of an animated GIF, a mapping video, uh, capturing protests and social unrest over Europe between 20 and 21 during the pandemic. So if when you've, you had to read single articles or individual articles, um, you would not capture the real picture. But when you put all those protests into a map and animate it, uh, that becomes a very, very powerful way how to drive the message uh, in a stronger way. Um, because in just one minute, you start to understand the spatial extent of those processes, the frequency and type of processes that have been happening over Europe um, in these two years. So social media is also um, exploiting these um, spatial visualizations and driving also therefore social perceptions and social understanding and also knowledge. Um, I'll try to um, run through this so that we'll have time for questions. Jork is becoming even more open with educational tools and, um, and providing all the most updated resources as well in that respect. Societies as well have um, becoming striking deals of open access um, in order to be able for UK researchers to um, publish open access at no cost to the individual. So the diamond um, root of open access. And I'll close with a bit of a lighter note. Um, another, another interesting um, rapidly expanding world facing geography is the gaming world. Uh, the digital gaming revolution, which is increasingly using geospatial data. Um, Google at the moment is leading the world with free and open geospatial games, embedding in their mapping interface. Um, we have GeoGuessr, which is a popular um, geography guessing game um, attached to Google Street View, which is also an, an open software where players have to guess, uh, have to see a picture and try to guess where it is uh, through Google um, Street View. Um, there is also Where on Earth um, is an online geography powered by Google, Google Earth. So each week, a picture of a place on Earth is posted and participants have to leave their guesses where it is. And if you have trouble to sleep at night and, and, and you want to start counting the sheep as the only solution, you may want to use Google Sheep View as well to try and spot pictures of sheep around the world through the Google Street View. So even that, talking about sheep, I'll close with this. I before spoke about the relevance between citizen science and open science. And I close with this very interesting story of Dorita um, from the Faroe Islands. Um, the Faroe Islands are home to around um, 50,000 people. And being hilly and very separated from mainland Europe by the Norwegian Sea, they aren't exactly the most car-friendly space around the world. So that means that until 2016, Faroe Islands could not be seen on Google Street View um, maps. So uh, Google Street View couldn't, uh, um, because of the lack of accessibility by car use, um, couldn't uh, be available on this, on this um, open software. Um, so Dorita came up with a, with a strategic plan. She said, OK, we don't have enough cars and, car and routes to be able to support Google Street View. But um, Pearl Island is home to more than 70,000 sheep. So what did she do? She, um, she um, asked Google um, Street View to sponsor her. And um, she strapped camera to the backs of sheep, literally, and to capture photos and islands um, all, all around Faroe Islands. And when Google um, eventually um, realized the success of this simple venture, um, they eventually funded her even more. And today, thanks to this simple but innovative story based on sheep, but also based on citizen knowledge and citizen understanding of how can we work around uh, digital um, limitations, um, Faroe Islands today is, is uh, featured on the Google Street View with, um, I might have to say, beautiful landscapes in that respect. So here we see that sometimes where 
you know, sometimes the citizens might actually provide more resilient solutions in their own um, dimension that um, complement very much so open science. Some references um, for those of you who are interested to, to learn more about so what I have been trying to tap. And I look forward to some questions and I thank you for your um, for your listening and for your patience with me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gauti, for the excellent presentation, very informative and very insightful. Um, uh, if there is anyone who'd like to raise a question, please um, feel free to raise your hand. Yes. yes, Fiona. Uh, Katarzyna Świerk from University of Gdańsk. Uh, maybe not a question, but a short opinion or summary. First of all, uh, thank you, Professor Gauci, for a very comprehensive and interesting presentation. Very interesting uh, for me uh, because you presented the bigger picture of uh, open science. Uh, in my opinion, sometimes uh, we forget about uh, that that open science is something more than open access and open research data, because we are all academics and our normal uh, society, our professor, researchers, students, PhD students. Uh, so that is very important that we as open science ambassador uh, will start to talking about the open science and citizen science. And your last example, it was uh, very, very interesting and showing that how it's important the engagement of, of, citizen, uh, of uh, citizens in, in science. Uh, and of course, the open science is something normal. We are in open science. Uh, I think that every day, every single day, we are touching this, the science. We even uh, don't realize uh, that it's really uh, happened. So um, my, opinion that, uh, my opinion is that uh, we as um, a society in that project should think more open about the science. That yes, is my uh, conclusion. yes I, I really totally agree with you. Um, in Malta here in Malta, we have some good examples of, of citizen science, like for example, spot the jellyfish um, coordinated by the Department of Geosciences. And on small countries, it's very, it's very easy and a bit more straightforward to, to create the right infrastructure for open, for open and citizen science. When it comes into larger countries where the input of data would be more massive and more varied, and therefore it requires also the know-how of an infrastructure and the support of an infrastructure that can eventually validate um, the data. Because we are moving more and more towards the citizen um, becoming very much involved, the more we release the data um, and being open and um, accessible, the more the citizens are going to pick it up, make it their own and use it. So today we find scientists who might not be qualified in a specific field, but they are keen, they are, they are experienced, they have a ground experience and they might do something relevant with it. So even um, the perception that citizen science is a less inferior form of science, that has to really change as well our, our, our um, concept that just because a person might not be qualified in, the, in that particular field, the data that he receives and what he makes use of it might not be um, relevant. We have to move away from that as well and try to understand and how we can validate and, and encourage them more uh, in that respect. Thank you very much for your for your for your question. I look forward Thank to you. more and more conversations with fellow ambassadors from all the CEU partners and the new three ones that are, that, are, that will eventually join us um, because it's really a dimension which is fascinating. I think it's important and it requires a lot of minds to understand it collectively. So we want to create a strong body of CEU experts in open science, we really need to uh, come together more and have more of these conversations and understanding the realities of our universities 
um, in, in promoting open science. Maria Laura? Sorry. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much, Fiona. Thank you very much, Gauti, for Professor Gauti, for your presentation. Um, it was uh, very, very interesting. Um, as uh, as uh, as previously previously was said, uh, you provide a, a wide overview of what open science is. And um, for me as researcher, I always think about open science as um, open papers uh, for, um, I mean, to, to provide a science for readers um, for free. And, uh, and uh, it's topic, a wide, um, uh, I mean, open science is, is wider than what, what we think. And uh, in, um, in, uh, in this sense, Open Science Ambassador, they have a very, very important role in this, in this project. We all know, but, uh, but uh, I would like to remark how important is uh, your activity in the research G project and in the Alliance. In general terms, we are working on, um, on uh, a common bachelor degree degree, a common PhD degree, and a common research plan. And, uh, and all the activities involved in the open science are critical for this to arrive to uh, a good port, no? uh, mm -hmm. to achieve the objectives that, uh, that uh, we, we need to achieve. Um, it's, it's, I mean, I think open science is, uh, and the activity involved in open science are really supporting uh, many of the objectives we want to achieve. Uh, if we, I mean, uh, it's crucial to provide our universities an open science, transparent science, and collaborative science. And when I say collaborative, um, uh, it's important what you said about uh, how open science is, uh, is helping in citizen science. And it's also it being, uh, it's starting to be very, very important in the social media and how it impacts in society. And uh, well, I just wanted to remark this to congratulate you for, for the, the, the great work that you are performing and to say the Open Science Ambassador how important is the role in, uh, in uh, the research G project. And uh, again, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Maria. That, that was really insightful. And it's really good news, uh, the kind of degrees that you are trying to propose. It's really something that probably even the University of Malta will eventually look into as a, as a potential form of uh, you know, educational program as well. Um, and yes, I mean, even in terms of curriculum, I think we should really be starting thinking about, um, you know, open science, even in teaching it to our students as well, because eventually our students will become our future researchers, they will become our future policy makers. Um, and therefore, I, I really believe that, I mean, if you had to ask our students, I, I barely think for them open science would be finding something online available and that's it. But tomorrow, these students will be, you know, in the most key positions of the country in terms of becoming lawyers, architects, um, policymakers, ministers. So we have to start from now with our students as well in communicating um, what is open science. And especially communicating, it's not a panacea. It's, a, it's an evolving, an evolving, so to speak, animal that keeps on getting stronger and stronger. Uh, and we have to find more and more skills how to tame it for the benefit of everyone, if that's a good analogy to put it to, to, um, to each one of us. Uh, once I was reading a paper and it says it's very important that we, we are the ones that drive open science, not that open science drives us. Uh, and what, what that means is that we have to always be in control and understanding how can open science benefit us rather than allow open science to drag us in making choices, which might be short-term choices, um, shorter vision choices, but they don't benefit to the future 
um, of science um, as a whole. So thank you, Maria Lauer. That was that was really interesting to get your perspective. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Unfortunately, we ran out of time, so we have to close our session here. Thank you again um, uh, to the speakers and also, especially to Rivian and also for all of you uh, who have joined us for this session. Um, uh, the recording of the session will be made available on the Alliance's YouTube channel. Also, stay tuned for more um, sessions, informative sessions, and other events that will take place during the months to come. Uh, you can follow the Euro European Universities of the CEU Facebook page as well for more events. And, and thank you all once again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fiona. I hope to see you all in other sessions. Really, really nice. Thank you, Juan Ramon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thing, one last thing before we go. Yes. Uh, Just, can we take um, a group photo, please? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just everyone